I know many of you in, in this room, and, and uh, I'm delighted that you are here. Um, and I wanted to tell you that I have had the distinct privilege of being the acting chief executive officer for about three years here mm. at Great Minds in STEM. Um, but now I wanted to inform you that we have found an individual who is incredibly supremely qualified to be the chief executive officer, not acting, full-blown chief executive officer for Great Minds in STEM. So he is going to take the reins and lead, uh, lead the operations, lead the execution of all of our programs, uh, including next year's conference. Uh, I will remain as chairman of the board and, and work more with the board members and st long-term strategy and things like that. So you'll continue to see me. But with that, uh, I want you to welcome Dr. Norman Fortenberry as our new CEO. Give him a round of applause. And I ask introduce yourselves if you haven't met him and all i ask is give him your support the way that you have supported me and great minds in stem in the past so with that let me ask norman to come up well thank you for the warm introduction i appreciate that and looking forward to my time as chief executive officer of great minds in stem i want to Welcome you all to the senior executive session entitled Turning the Tide, Defending Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Access. We have a distinguished uh, set of panelists to discuss this critical and timely topic. I urge you to review their full bios in the flyer. It has full bios. Short, but full. Um, but for timeliness, I will simply introduce them by name and organization, and we have them. I have them listed in alphabetical by last name, and I'm, that's not the way they're listed here. Uh, so maybe I'll try to read from a distance. On the left end, which is easier for you in the audience, my left, your right, I guess that's stage right, uh, Miguel Alemani, of, who's the interim chief executive officer of the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, uh, Dr. Scott Walston, a vice president and chief engineer, enterprise technology at the Boeing Company. Uh, Jeremy Gauthier, who is Director of the Coast Guard Investigative Service, United States Coast Guard. Maria Lehman, uh, who's President of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And Dr. Keith Moo Young, who is Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Education at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Today's topic is one of extreme importance to the nation as it struggles with the legacy of systemic racism and with a critical shortage of science, engineering, technology, math, and medical professionals. <coughs> The Supreme Court's decision in June outlawing affirmative action with regard to race in college admissions has already, been wide, has already had wide-ranging effects. Uh, approximately 26 states have, now have anti-diversity, uh, equity, inclusion legislation uh, that's either uh, been made into law or is in process. Many colleges and universities are taking the view that they have to reconsider affirmative action with regard to any protected population including women and persons with disabilities. So the effects go well beyond underrepresented racial and ethnic minorities. Moreover, Edward Bloom, the conservative activist who has been fighting affirmative action for decades under a variety of organizational names, has broadened his efforts to include the explicit exemption that Chief Justice Roberts carved out for the military service academies, as well as efforts by private entities. Nonetheless, the current administration and federal agencies, such as the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, have remained committed to addressing underrepresentation in STEM fields. However, the landscape looks much different in an increasing number of states where broad, fuzzy legislation has many questioning what they can and cannot do. That sets the context for today's panel, where we seek to understand what is being done and what can be done in a fraught social and political environment to ensure full participation in the STEM workforce by all parts of our national population. Because the alternative is not only an underpowered workforce, but one that doesn't reflect the nation it seeks to serve. Therefore, so my first question goes to Dr. Scott Walston of Boeing. As the nation's demographics change, how do we maintain support for institutions of higher education and corporations if their students, faculty, staff, and employees do not reflect the increasing share of the nation's national population that is non-white and non-male. Right. Thanks, Norman. Uh, yeah, I would say certainly as you described, the environment is, is a tough environment uh, for diversity and inclusion, uh, for STEM 
uh, students and, and professionals. Uh, that being said, uh, I, there has been progress. If you look at the, the 2023 uh, report on diversity in STEM sponsored by NSF, uh, over the last 10 years, there has been uh, an increase, I, I'd say a significant increase, uh, in the number of underrepresented minorities having gone up by 10 percent uh, over that 10-year period uh, for those employed in the STEM field. So there is progress, uh, but as, as Norman said, the, the environment uh, is, is tough, and you could argue, are we going to have that same progress over the next 10 years? Uh, and, and also, if you look at, as the question said, do, do we as, as uh, employers uh, represent the, the nation in terms of our diversity? Uh, you know, 51% of the country uh, is women, 35% are in STEM. 31% uh, of the country is underrepresented minorities, but only 24% in STEM. And so we don't represent the country, and, and certainly in some fields it's even worse. Uh, when I go to universities and, uh, you know, engage in, with their engineering uh, departments and, and look at the, the diversity there, in some cases I, I see incredible diversity, 50% uh, women in some engineering departments. Uh, but more often than not, you see something more like 25% female. And, uh, and so that clearly doesn't reflect the population. So there are some places that are doing better than others. Uh, you know, from a, a Boeing standpoint, we certainly uh, put a lot of emphasis from a recruiting standpoint, uh, uh, clearly, Events like GMIS, uh, we we attend these and, and many others like Nesby, Shep, uh, SWE, and so on. Uh, over a dozen that, that we support and and preferentially recruit uh, at at events like this as opposed to other places. Uh, we've done a lot more with H HBCUs uh, over the last five or ten years, and and so I'd say we're making progress. Uh, but we do uh, you know, need to do better. Uh, and uh, so, you know, the question being, sh how, do we, how do we kind of look at institutions that maybe aren't doing as well? And at least for us, when we think about recruiting, we're gonna, we're gonna go to those places that, that represent, you know, uh, the diversity of the, of the country and the region, because uh, we do see a lot of regional differences as well. Uh, and, and so that's, that's kind of how we treat it. Uh, and I, I'd be interested as we go through this panel, you know, we, I, I talked a lot about kind of recruiting. And if you look at our uh, early career professionals, uh, the diversity is, is actually fairly good. It's about what the availability is uh, coming out of uh, uh, universities. Uh, but I, I know for ourselves, and, and I'd say really the entire industry and, and maybe the country doesn't do a good job on retention and promotion. If you look at the underrepresented minorities, the females, uh, there's a pretty significant decrease as, as they go through the careers in the, in the percentage representation. So I, I think that's something that, that we need to face into. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to comment on that particular question before I move on? Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just add from a civil engineering perspective um, how bad the numbers are. Um, practicing civil engineers for women are 14 percent. That number's been as high as 20. If you look at all engineering, um, it the numbers have been as high as 30 percent. Um, the 2022 numbers I don't have the 23s yet um, shows graduating at 23 percent women. Um, and there has not been a study since COVID, but I'm sure the numbers are worse. 70% of women, seven zero, leave the profession within 20 years of graduation. So not only do we not have a pipeline, it's a leaky pipeline. Thank you. The 2022 paper published in the Social and Personality Psychology Compass asserts that much of the opposition to affirmative action comes from some members of advantaged populations who see DEIA efforts as a threat to their resources, cultural position, and or positive self-image. And that reference is in the uh, pamphlet that you have. 
Certainly that seems plausible when talking about cases where 20 percent of the available slots in college admissions went to qualified minorities, but they are deemed responsible for denying access by innumerable majority students who could not compete for the other 80 percent of the available slots, even assuming they were qualified in the first place. As a follow-up to my point about Edward Bloom's efforts to expand the SCOTUS decision beyond academic admissions to private organizations and employers, which could affect scholarship programs, internships, management development programs, et cetera. Therefore, a two-part question for Maria Lehman of ASCE. What do you anticipate to be the result of such an action from your perspective as president of the nation's oldest engineering society, representing more than 150,000 civil engineers employed in private practice, government, industry, and academe, and how will your efforts within ASCE change, if at all? Well, thanks for the softball question. <laughs> um, so let me start off with that we are a professional society. Roughly a third academicians, a third practitioners, and, um, and a third in government. And uh, when I speak to people around the country and actually around the world, this is not, I mean, I laugh that, you know, that our profession is very pale male and stale. And I only check one box because I'm pale female and stale. Um, but it's a math problem. There's not enough people to do the work that we need done. And so we need to have a rising tide for all boats, period. So I think um, where I'd like to start with this, um, ASCE has had a policy since 1993 on diversity and inclusion. Um, every three years we review it and we tweak it for what's going on in the industry. And I'm sorry if you're over there, but it's like hard to see around the podium here. <laughs> Um, and let me read it to you because I'll tell you what, there's a percentage that comes back after and I hear about it, right? It's, if it's really good, I hear about it. And if it's really bad, I hear about it. Um, the American Society of Civil Engineers fosters so, so speak into the Okay, I gotta s see it too. No. Fosters a fully inclusive culture that celebrates individual uniqueness, engenders a sense of belonging, and promotes equitable opportunity for all people to participate as members and stakeholders of the civil engineering community regardless of identity. ASCE and its staff is committed to inclusive engineering problem solving that recognizes values and addresses the unique needs of the diverse demographic, social, economic, and cultural groups when considering, balancing, and mitigating societal, environmental, and economic impacts of our work. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of commitments. Uh, we have been talking about this for a long time. I'm frustrated. I've been in the business for 43 years. The numbers are worse. I have granddaughters. So like, if you think you're angry about your, your daughters, trust me, it's worse when you have granddaughters. Um, I want it to be a better place for them. And so we have to do better. And so I think no matter what happens inside the Beltway, and I spend a lot of time inside the Beltway, and I scratch my head, I'm an engineer, it's illogical, it's hard to deal with. Um, but no matter what happens, the professional societies have a role, and we see us as kicking it up. So in fact, as kind of a reaction to this, we have an action plan this year that we have not had in the past um, relative to, for example, if you come to our conferences, you are signing a way that you are going to behave the way we expect you to behave. Um, in the past, you know, if you're not a member, I have no way of telling you, knock it off, right? So there is a code of conduct for our conferences that we approved. We have a board policy of what is going to happen. Um, we have to look at certain venues, for example, because maybe the code of ethics at that venue isn't consistent with ours. Um, and we also, we're kicking off our convention next week in Chicago with um, a whole topic on, it's basically called blame it on the brain, okay? The, the brain's wiring on unconscious bias against anyone. And um, it's a very interactive thing. I've done it with ACEC in the past. And you realize that you bring certain things to the table that you have to just knock it off. Um, I can tell you, um, I have three sons, okay? And I can tell you they have less tolerance for this than their wives do. And two of them are engineers. I mean, the Gen X, Y, Zers have no patience for this whatsoever. And so we have to do this as a function of need and you know, let them do what they're going to do. I think we can end run and skirt some of the policies just by doing what we need to do to make sure that we have enough 
and competent, and that's gonna mean some different programs to be able to level people up. Um, but we're ready, willing to do that, and I know universities are too. So um, it's a little dicier on the service academies. Um, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, you're watching how women's rights issues in the Pentagon is, is you know, front page news instead of like running the country, but you know, be that as it may, I can say that. I, I don't work for the federal government. But um, it's, it's, it's frustrating that we're in this place. And so we have to use the venues and the organizations that we have to make a positive impact. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that? So the efforts of Bloom and his allies may be especially troubling to affinity organizations such as the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. For example, uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education on an October uh, 5th issue uh, reported on, on Ohio Senate Bill 83. In addition to the now standard efforts to ban most mandatory diversity training, prohibit the use of diversity statements in hiring or admissions, and preventing institutions from funding diversity offices, it would have required state institutions to ban affinity, open quote, explicitly designed to segregate faculty, staff, or students by group identities such as race, sex, gender identity, or gender expression, close quote. This is interpreted as meaning groups such as SHIP, SWE, NSBE, et cetera, as well as faculty analogs, as well as ethnic housing or graduation events uh, would be outlawed. Therefore, the next question goes to SHIP CEO, Miguel Alemani. Uh, with the confirmed loss of affirmative action based on race, ethnicity, and college admissions, and the threatened loss for private scholarships and fellowships, how will you change strategy to ensure higher education access by your members? Thank you. That, there's. Um so about five or six ways to, uh, to answer that, and uh, you, you told me I can't talk more than 45 minutes, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, but I, let, me, let me just preface that for a second. You know, the, the, this law and the politicization of diversity that we're undergoing in this country is, is having an impact. But the large majority of companies, the smart companies, they continue to do the right thing. And they're doing the right thing, by the way, not because it's the right thing, but because it is dollars and cents. It is a matter of money. When you have an organization and everybody is the same, your solutions are gonna, not gonna be as good as you have diversity of thought, diversity of points of view. So companies like, like, like Boeing, like Procter & Gamble, like Johnson & Johnson, they will continue seeking out minority students no matter what because they need that for their, for their workforce. So, so that side of the question is going to be okay. We are having issues, however, in schools because we're seen as, a, as an organization that has to be banned. And to that, we're doing two things. Uh, number one is we, we've been working with the legisl legislations that are passing, particularly in Texas and in, uh, in Florida and a couple of states, to soften the language of the bills because we are making the case that we are helping the domestic workforce of this country get the right number of STEM and engineers and scientists that they need. So the companies don't have to import from another country. And that seems to resonate with the same people who are anti-diversity. They, they, they start, they make them think. You know, if you block African Americans, Hispanics, and all these people from getting help and getting education, you're going to have to go out to another country to find engineers to bring it because you're not going to have sufficient engineers in, 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 uh, in the country. That has been reasonably successful, uh, fairly successful in Florida, uh, and less successful in, in, in Texas, but we continue. We have to change our strategy. We have to make sure that, that the government, both sides of government, understand that when they do that, when they put blocks to minorities progressing, they're shooting themselves in the foot because they're affecting the domestic workforce of the country, weakens the country. The, the last thing that I, that I would add is, is we have to um, go out of our way to make sure that we, we pick up the slack that is created when governments get out of the game. So we have to make sure that the minorities are going to go into college, that they're gonna be supported while they're in college, that they're gonna get a job when they graduate, you know, career fairs, scholarships, and support. So we have to literally double our mission to make sure that nobody gets left behind. That, by the way, I, I believe is also fairly successful, and we just issued a, um, a study uh, two weeks ago, and we're looking at, at longitudinal um, assessment of Hispanics in STEM, particularly Hispanics, 
and our success rate has doubled in the last 10 years. Our, our, our percent of Hispanics in STEM is, is, is almost, it's 99.7% higher, almost 100% higher. Additionally, uh, Shep has, has done a, a, a multi-year study. Um, students that join Shep graduate at a significantly higher percentage than, than I mean, higher rate than, than non, non-members. And, and I look at Hispanics themselves, 50% of Hispanics do not graduate from college. They enter, but they, they drop out. If you're a SHEP member, that number goes up to 80% graduates. So it's a significant difference. So if, if the government can't have their hands tied and sit in these things, we're going to be at the table, and we're going to pick up the slack, and we're going to deliver that to maintain the momentum. So it just makes our job more difficult, but we'll do it. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on that? OK. Um, Certainly the most immediate and direct effects of the Supreme Court decision uh, have been on the academic sector. Many institutions are tying themselves in knots, relabeling existing activities, or in many cases taking creative steps to initiate new programs, open to all students that address issues of access. Some have even revised their admissions requirements. For example, Caltech announced in August that it will drop admissions requirements for calculus, physics, and chemistry courses for students who don't have access to them and offer alternate paths to prove mastery of the material. Therefore, the next question goes to Dr. Keith Moo Young of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. How is the SCOTUS decision already affecting your ability to recruit students to a selective institution of higher education? Thanks, Norman. You know, it's very interesting because this decision really goes back to 1996 when Mm -hmm. the state of California passed a referendum Prop 209 that basically took race-based admissions out of all uh, decisions of of admissions in California. One of the things that uh, we did at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute is we went to our legal team immediately. We actually felt, even before the Supreme Court, that this was coming to a theater near you, so we've got to act accordingly. And it's not as bad as it may seem, because we had already taken steps prior to the Supreme Court to make sure that, one, we access a larger population of students and that we continue to diversify our our community. Uh, Our current president, Marty Smith, who used to be the provost at MIT, uh, his plan is to create a welcoming and inclusive uh, environment for our campus. And what that means is that when we look at our decisions at admissions, we, along with hundreds and hundreds of other highly selective and selective institutions throughout the country, we all use what's called the Common App. And about 1,000 schools throughout the country, if you have children, they probably apply to the Common App. So the Common App actually came out and worked with us to where I don't think there's a single school that now has on the Common App race as a category when the students apply. So how do we assure that students do get the opportunity? Well, it's interesting because I spent half the day on Wednesday with our admissions team, and what we were looking at were ways in which we were actually taking a look at the students in different perspectives. And, and, and what we have is we have a rating system basically for the strength of what type of curriculum they come through. And that also equates to where did they go to high school? And so based on those requirements, uh, some schools, uh, we don't require an essay, but some schools are now requiring essays for the students. And if they have been socially or economically disadvantaged in some cases they can write that up in their admissions applications some schools uh, do interviews uh, where you know they they down select to a certain select group of students and then they interview them every student that applies to Rensselaer uh, is uh, has an admissions counselor who then discusses the case with the admissions team to see who we're going to let in for that particular year. 
And we base a lot of our decision and decision making based on the student. Now, one thing that also, if you also look at socioeconomics of students, especially students who are from underrepresented backgrounds, a significant portion of them come with high financial need. So one of the things we use is uh, need-based aid. And in the need-based aid, you know, at schools like Rensselaer, a student who uh, comes from certain types of backgrounds will get up to and in excess of almost 100% of their uh, schooling paid for. Now, that was one of the things that when we look back and ratchet back our uh, decisions made on the new laws, we had to take a step back and say, okay, so how do we make sure? So one of the things we had to do, for example, is we had uh, one of our distinguished graduates, uh, we had to uh, remove his uh, scholarship reception because that would be a violation uh, of the new Supreme Court ruling. However, what we've done is we've wrapped the events into a, a, uh, you know the overall events uh, that we're having, and you know in order to make sure that we are uh, meeting financial need, you know we we now have to make these decisions based on uh, you know socioeconomics and their, their scores as opposed to before we were just basically making it, uh, well, we were making a lot of decisions based on the fact that we were giving full financial uh, aid to our underrepresented minority students. So now we're not doing that, but we're using other <coughs> factors to try to uh, incentivize these students. What's going to happen? Well, if you look at the University of California, it's very interesting because almost 30 years ago when uh, Prop 209 came into effect, significant drop in the number of uh, minorities uh, in their programs. But now if you look today, I think there are four uh, Hispanic serving institutions that are in the University of California, uh, Santa Cruz, uh, Riverside, Merced, and Irvine and two or three that are emerging. Uh, and, and so it, it's very interesting how the tide has swung, but they, they have continued to abide by Prop 209. It's just that the population base of California just get, lends itself to, ha they have to diversify because the better students are coming from uh, backgrounds of underrepresented minority, especially the large portion of the population in California that's Hispanic. Thank you, anyone else want to comment? Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's useful to get a federal perspective as well, and given the Hatch Act, I can't ask Mr. Gauthier to comment on the Supreme Court decision. Uh, but I think the following is fair game. Can you let us know if the Coast Guard has any plans to alter its hiring and retention practices? Uh, thanks for the question. I, I, I really don't. Uh, I think the Coast Guard's focus really is about um, their recruiting effort is all about those seeking or, or ha having a propensity to serve. That's what the, the whole recruiting effort is about and just maximizing that diversity. On the, on the retention side of the things, the promotion aspects within the military system, there's laws prohibiting affirmative action associated with a session, and therefore it's already not a part of that whole criteria. Um, even the Coast Guard Academy, the, what the, the, the propensity to serve, the education, the physical and the medical is really the evaluation criteria by which you get into and ascend within, within the ranks of the Coast Guard. I mean, the Coast Guard right now is certainly not immune to recruiting efforts, as all the services are, and I think that's more emblematic of a kind of a society aspect of things. So the, the, the predominant efforts are all about focused on engagement with all affinity groups across all sets. The Coast Guard, I think, has had more, um, been with the Coast Guard for a year. Prior to that, I spent 22 years with NCIS. Um, and it's, it's amazing to me as I, I think about that time as, as a former Marine as well, the, the focus is on educating people about what the Coast Guard does. The, this, the, the depth and scope of missions and the skills needed, particularly in STEM and, and, and elsewhere, that's really the, the bulk of the recruiting effort. I just don't think a lot of people understand how much the Coast Guard does when you look at 11 statutory missions 
what's brought to bear, it's pretty significant. And so that focus is all about making sure that the service is reflective of those in the communities that we serve. So I, I don't think the decision's gonna have an impact because there's no plan to change the manner in which we're recruiting or retaining efforts. Thank you. <coughs> Some feel that this entire discussion is a tempest in a teapot, that the implications of the SCOTUS decision are quite narrow. I think we've disabused anyone here of that notion. But if only to put a nail in the coffin, let me return to Dr. Mu Young and ask him the following. Do you have a response to suggestions made by former Harvard President Larry Summers that affirmative action is only an issue at 100 or so elite colleges with, with other colleges admitting 40 to 60 percent of their applicants? You know, that, that statement is very, uh, a, an interesting one, but, but when you look at the admissions at elite colleges throughout the United States, many of them, many of them have done a tremendous amount of work to essentially make access to their schools free, especially to those with high financial need, which tend to come from areas uh, both rural and urban that are highly populated by uh, students of color. And so, you know, you know, the affirmative action that was uh, taken, you know, for example, you know, schools like, uh, you know, undergraduate schools like Bowdoin, uh, schools locally like, uh, you, know, you know, here, the Claremont Colleges, they have made a commitment at their board level that we are going to make sure that if a student is qualified to get into our institution, we're going to give them full financial access to the institution. In some cases, they are highly scholarshiped. Uh, they have large endowments. Uh, in other cases, like in the case of a Rensselaer, what, what we do is we do tuition discounting. And what that means is that our sticker price is $85,000, but on the average, we're giving students on the tuition portion of it up to 55 to 60 percent tuition discount. And what we do is we balance that. So the students with the highest need financially, we provide them with. So from a perspective of looking at affirmative action and what uh, Summers said, I, I think there's a lot of holes in his argument because many institutions, especially those at the private sector, are doing a tremendous job of providing the financial wherewithal. Our biggest issue, <coughs> the biggest issue that you have is that for first-time freshman undergraduate enrollment, if you take the SAT, which is not a great measure of student success, but if you take the SAT and you say, okay, what does it take to get into the top, you know, the top 20, top 30 institutions in the country. On the average, most of those schools average somewhere between on the, on the math verbal combined score, max of 1,600, 1,500 plus. Well, guess what? They're typically somewhere between 300 to 400 African American and Hispanic students throughout the entire country in any given year that will score in that range. So what ends up happening with those students is that it becomes a bidding war for those students. So, what, so how do we fill our class? So what ends up happening is then you go to the next tier of students and then sometimes it's life experience, sometimes it's athletics. Sometimes they bring a very special skill set. So for example, they may want to be an engineer but they are an expert violinist. And they want to, you, you know, and we, for example, we have a music program on our campus and many of our engineers do a dual major where they, uh, because they have an affinity for music, they'll major, they'll double major in uh, mechanical engineering and music as an example. Well, those all count. And our admission staffs, I, I know ours, but also at other elite schools and you know, institutions at the private in the private sector, they will give the students points 
towards their admissions process. As, as it relates to Summer's comment about the 40 to 60 percent of the students gaining admissions in the public and in some, in case, in some cases the private sector, uh, you know, that's the beauty of American higher education is that there's a, there are 3,000 plus institutions that give students a world of opportunity to discover themselves. And it's always interesting when you look at, for example, the NSF survey of where students went at their undergraduate institution to go on to get their doctorate. Now, of course, many of the top institutions, just because of volume, will have many students that go on to doctorates. But it's always interesting to see Hispanic serving institutions and historically black colleges and universities always send many students on towards getting their doctoral degrees. And you know, many of us could not have started at a predominantly white institution because, you know, at least in my own case, I didn't get enough financial aid to go to the University of Pennsylvania, so I started at a historically black college and university. And I think that's the beauty of American higher education. And that's kind of the, that, that's missing in his statement uh, about why we have the different types of institutions we have. Thank you. I think we have a few moments, and if the panel is agreeable, we can take some questions from the audience. Great. Any questions? Oh, this is so disappointing. You're killing the faculty member We've that got, I used uh, to be. We've got some folks here from the Coast Guard Recruiting Command, if anybody's looking to sign up today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a question here, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the discussion early on, I believe Dr. Walston may have brought it up, regarding the whole aspect of we have a, a great deal of people going into the workforce, right, with, with uh, underrepresentation, particularly as the early career. The challenge now is that pull through you kind of talked about. What can we do to help that pull through of getting, you know, broader representation across the more senior ranks or mid-career to senior ranks going forward? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a shot at that, and I'm sure others will have comments. But, you know, it's it's frustrating to me that you don't see a lot of data out there that that would tell you, you know, like a Harvard Business Review study, if there could be, I'm just not aware, but of, of, of the definitive reasons for why some of these groups, you know, don't progress at the same rate and, or, or leave the workforce. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, I've, I've been in, involved in a lot of uh, forums talking to, to women engineers and there's, a, there's myriad reasons, uh, but there's certain things we can do, uh, you know, in terms of the, the culture, you know, a culture of inclusiveness uh, at a workplace, uh, being more flexible about work arrangements or part-time opportunities. Uh, and so I, I, I think there are some things, certainly uh, mentorship plays a big role in that. Uh, people want to see people above them that look like them, and, and, all, and, and I think it's the responsibility of, of, of those to, to kind of help pull. Uh, and, uh, and, and so there's a lot that we can do, uh, and we just need to, to do more because the numbers, you know, whether it's advancement in, you know, up through management and executive ranks, up through technical ranks, it's pretty consistent that there's a fall off across the board. Any other questions? There's a question over here. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, you, oh, you, thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Colonel Steve Hastead. I'm the head of the biology department at the U.S. Air Force Academy. And uh, my question is particularly uh, relates to the resourcing at the, the college and university level for, as we're, as we're targeting and trying deliberately to bring in more diverse representation from students that don't have those high SAT scores, that don't have that access through their high school programs. Um, I've, I've been very excited at the Academy that we are now shifting some of our focus through some graduates and endowments away from the honors program towards more of the academic success center to robust 
our our infrastructure to help those students that don't come in with those high test scores, high SATs, whatever. I'm just I'm just curious, uh, sir, particularly at the Rensselaer level. What what are you doing? As you you mentioned that you're you've moved away from the the calc, the chemistry, some of those prerequisites. Well, I'm I'm curious as to the level of resourcing that you have at, at your university to help you know bring those students into the fold so that we can then retain and 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 continue to develop them. Thank well, you. Well, there's a number of uh, programs that that we rely on heavily so so we do uh, bridge programming uh, early on early access uh, programs for students one of the things we started this year uh, the pandemic has really taken a toll on our, our our students from the standpoint of they're not quite as prepared as previous years especially in the calculus uh, physics uh, calculus based physics so this summer we actually ran a trial with our students using uh, the Alex programming uh, offered by McGraw Hill and we offered it to uh, a select number of our freshman students for free that we identified that we said may have some issues and uh, because it was volunteer uh, we, we were a little uh, little on the uh, we, we, we were overly optimistic that uh, students would do it. Uh, so we, we offered it to about uh, 600 and about 300 did it. So we got a 50% uh, hit rate. Uh, and, and the beauty of it was that uh, it was self-paced, AI driven, so uh, no faculty involved, all AI driven. And uh, the students completed it, you know, like I said, at their own pace. And our goal is to really look at how did it affect their fall freshman uh, classes. And so this, this spring, we'll be doing the analysis to determine. But institutions are going to have to do a better job uh, of preparing the students. Uh, one of the things I'll say is, you know, uh, uh, I was the dean of engineering at California State University, Los Angeles, for many years. And before student success was even popular. We put in programming in 2007, 2008, and uh, the program's still going now, and you know, we've had, they had, they've had success rates uh, that are probably, I, I can't think of anyone who's been able to meet the same success rates. And what I mean by that is freshman, freshman to freshman, when I got there, we were at 60% retention. Uh, they were 60% of them coming back uh, from fall to fall. When I left in 2013, my last class, we were at 92% of them returning. And it was because of the programming that we put in place, uh, both summer bridge programming and year-round programming to help them with their early on coursework. That's really exciting about the... Uh you actually have a perfect test case there. You invited 600, 300 applied, and so now you can look at, you know who you invited, you can see the test population and the, yep, yep. that's great, that's yep. fantastic. You know, the only thing I would add to that is um, I think it's really important that you look at all these different programs that we're, we're going to do. I mean, I think what we learned over COVID um, is it was hard on everyone, but we also learned how to deliver things differently because we had no choice. Uh, if, if you look at some of the schools that are um, a lot of two, two programs, a lot of three, two programs that are trying to help with those first couple of years where you can have much smaller classes, much more intense focus on the science and math so that, that kids can be successful, um, I think it's very frustrating um, that you can't bridge that gap. And, uh, you know, we have to get out of this. I mean, when I went to school, and actually when my two sons that are engineers went to school, we were still saying, you know, the professor would say, look to your left, look to the right, only one of you is going to be left in four years. And we have to stop doing that. It's a yes and and a not a no but. Because um, we simply do not have enough people. And so we have to get better at this. I mean, our ability to, to support a modern economy with the infrastructure depends on that. A question here. I guess along those lines, you know, having worked in manufacturing, we see a huge shortage in the trades and people going into the trades with a lot of the younger generations starting to pursue um, 
more degreed professions. And then you also mentioned earlier that 70% of women who go into engineering end up leaving. I mean, do we have a firm understanding on the data of where these people are going to in, so that we can do more focused targets of redirecting in the STEM? Um, SWE's been doing, I mean, SWE's different than the other affinity groups because NSF has been funding them to be doing deep research into this since the 90s. Um, and so they look at it. Um, I, I think it's not where they're going to, it's where they're running from. Because 80% of that 70% say they can't stand the workplace culture. And I can tell you, you know, my 30 year olds, the boys, feel the same way. All right. We need work work life balance. We need to value what they do as other professions value better than we do in a lot of cases. And so um, I think those changes are coming because we have this shortage. So we're seeing that. Um, but it's in a lot of cases, it's the culture. It's the, you know, the commoditization of what we're doing. It's it's about, you know, the race to the bottom instead of the race to the top. And so as you're looking at how we're moving forward, we are looking at that doesn't work. You need to have innovation. You need to have all this input. And I can tell you, we're actually having a meeting um, this this month um, with a number of senior officials um, in the administration because there's a lot of money being spent on workforce development, and a lot of it is going in block grants to the states. And we haven't seen. I mean, we've been flat in our from trades, you know, from the laborer on the construction site to the bus driver to the designer, to the surveyor, to the CEO. We have been flat for more than a decade. And if you look at the demographics of high school, you're seeing 10 to 20% less kids in high school because they're not there in the next decade. Big problems unless we start thinking about this holistically. And those schools that do are gonna win and there's gonna be a lot of schools that are gonna be out of business. Think about a 10 or 20% cut in your customers and how do you deal with that so I think we're at a point now where we have to think drastically different and you know maybe it's that um, working with a contractor that if you hire somebody and there's there's DOTs around the country that are doing this they'll pay first and last month's rent okay they'll get transportation for these individuals they will put them into a skilled trade program when you graduate from that they're willing to then invest in a two-year degree if that's what you want to do and then after that invest in a four-year degree so we can build them from the ground up as opposed to just saying well you can either go this way or this way um, we have to have flexibility and we have to have room for technologists technicians administrators um, and engineers and it's okay that you don't have to be it's not all or nothing um, we've been in this long-term thing that it's got to be all or nothing, and that's just not working for us. Norman? Cool. Thank yes. I just, just want to add one, one point. It's, it's not directly related, but it's in the same area. You know, we have a leaky buckets in more, most of corporate America. It's one of the biggest issues. But I, I, today, part of it is due to the success that we've had. This is very, sounds weird, but, but stay with me for a second. My generation came from a place where it was very difficult to get ahead because we're minorities. And then we went to work at a corporation where it was very difficult to get ahead because we're minorities. So we, we found support, we found ERGs, we found sponsors. And over time, we've grown. I look at, at my company. I promoted the first, second, and, th and fourth women to upper management in Europe in the history of the company. And it took the CEO intervention to be able to get it done. Today is 51% female. So, so it is tremendous progress. The problem is it doesn't match the progress that we had in academia. In, in academia, if you're a minority in school, there are no issues. If you're Asian and your friend is African American, the other friend is gay, they're just friends. They're not black or white, or, they're just friends. And then they come to corporate America where you're different and you need to find support or whatever, and they don't like it because they, that's not their life. So our culture in corporate America is not advancing as fast as, as it is in academia. So a lot of employees get disgusted with the, with the, uh, with the, uh, with the corporate culture and they leave. And, and, and that corporate culture, if, you're, if your employee has been there 10 years, is actually fantastic compared to what it was. It's just not good enough yet. So we have to work we have to pivot in corporate America 
and work to make that closer to the to the reality the students live on campus. Cool. Thank you. Anyone else? I'd like to summarize several points. Uh, just to burn them in your, in your mind. The threat posed by the Supreme Court decision and its follow-on efforts go well beyond college admissions alone, and though that is very significant, to include private businesses, professional societies, and other nonprofit organizations. The threat goes beyond racial and ethnic minorities to any so-called protected group, including women, persons with disabilities, veterans, older workers, et cetera. There are people and organizations committed to continued efforts at diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, and each of us has a responsibility to do what we can to ensure full participation in the American talent pool. It's a matter of economic and social necessity. It makes business sense, and it's the right thing to do. Points made by several of our panelists. Uh, Scott talked about uh, recruiting where the, where the people are. Uh, Miguel, Maria talked about we need more bodies, period. And that's the bottom line. You got to go where they are. Uh, Miguel talked about uh, the implications for the domestic workforce, which reinforces Maria's point, if we don't. Uh, get to those people and, and to the people. And Keith talked about um, creating uh, welcoming and inclusive environments for students as part of what we need to do uh, to continue building on the environment that Miguel just mentioned. Um, uh, the Coast Guard and probably by extension the rest of the federal government it really is looking at what they can do to build the to select the best people and, and build the capacity of those people irrespective of, of their demographics. Um, and uh, uh, Keith talked about uh, a number of, of wraparound efforts, uh, bridge programs, et cetera, uh, that can be very useful. Um, during the Q and A, Scott also mentioned the importance of mentorships and senior uh, among by senior leaders of more junior staff. Um, and uh, uh, those were the major points I wanted to, to hit on. I want to thank you all for being here. I thought we had an incredibly uh, informative and successful panel. Uh, I, before you take off, I want to point out that each of our panelists, you can't see it because it's on the table, each of our panelists has been given a challenge coin, a GMIS challenge coin, representing, uh, recognizing the 35th anniversary. And so each of them will have that as a memento of, of this panel. And we thank you all for your time and attention and for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.